Hi class, this is your instructor, Skylar Huff, and welcome to the 55th chapter, which is Ecosystems and the Biosphere. Although you're seeing where it says chapter 54, we are actually in the 55th chapter. The reason I am here is, of course, to ensure I appropriately review community biodiversity. So you'll find this back in the 54th chapter, beginning on page 1185. So I want to do this once more to ensure that you can explain what species diversity is and how it's composed of both richness and evenness. So these are thought as one or as a whole because these things being species diversity, including species richness and species evenness, they vary from, of course, community to community and are greatly influenced by both those biotic and abiotic factors. So as that is the case, just keep in mind that when a person or when an ecologist speaks to species diversity, that they're referring to this measure of both the number of species within a community and, of course, that relative importance of each of those species being, of course, by way of its size, the productivity, or even the abundance of such. So when I speak to that, let's get a bit more into species richness. So species richness is the number of species in that community. And the way, in fact, you determine that is by counting the species of interest. And of course, it's those differing species of interest. In the tropical rainforests and even the coral reefs of, in those communities, each of which are extremely high in their species richness. And of course, contrasting such would be, of course, those isolated islands and mountaintops, which will exhibit lower species richness. So looking here, class, let's determine the species richness here in A. This is figure 5417A. So we have this species, there is that species, there is this species, and finally, the species we have here. So to help you with what I'm asking class, the richness here in this community is four. I'll continue. So now getting on to species evenness, this tells the relative abundance of a species compared to another species. For instance, if I were to give this being species, I guess go A, species B, species C, and then this is species D, let's count together class and determine species richness. So the richness class for species A excuse me, not richness class, I'm referring to species evenness here. So the species evenness, A class, there is only one of those individuals. B, there is only one of those individuals. Now for C, also only one individual. And now D, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So we now have both richness and evenness in this example community. So richness was, of course, four, meaning there are four species in this community, and evenness for each species found. So speaking to diversity of this community, I would definitely say for these wildfires class, as far as diversity, yes, you could say, yes, it's diverse in having four species. However, speaking to evenness, if you were to be asked whether this community class is evenness, even, excuse me, or does it exhibit evenness, what would you all say? I would say this community class has, or at least exhibits, low species evenness 
because of the four species present, it's one species, species D, that of course has a lot more individuals, meaning there are 17 of those, as opposed to just one of each of the other three species in the community. So given this and this example, and here's another example class that I say you all can do on your own to of course determine not just evenness here, but also species richness, I would just say, on your own, determine each of those, and I'll give you just a few moments here. All right, so having done that, let us now continue on to math here. And I'm not saying that you all are about to do math. However, what I am going to say is that doing this, we're going to get to the way in which ecologists de have developed various mathematical expressions, such as the Shannon Index. To, and the Shannon Index is, is here to represent species diversity quantitatively. And as I say this, it's more than just these numbers of richness and evenness. And there are other indices used to express species richness, species evenness, or I just say broadly class species diversity. But of course, these diversity indices, they enable ecologists to compare species diversity in different communities. And although we could, of course, go through the process of calculating the Shannon Index, I don't believe that we will. However, if you all want to, just let me know. But of course, conservation biologists, they use those diversity indices as part of a comprehensive approach to saving and preserving biodiversity. So now let's get on class into, of course, an explanation as to why some communities have more species than others. So what determines whether this community class has this number of species or that number of species? Well, you're looking class here at examples. Examples are as follows. So the structural complexity of habitats. And if it's not, I guess you say strikingly obvious, I would say that just by having a structural, structurally complex habitat, it provides class those micro habitats, those small, small er habitats for other species to inhabit each of those individual niches. And of course, it's not just here or there. Nextly, what I'll get to here, class, is geographic isolation. So with geographic isolation, this is that distance effect. So by having those species spread out in differing areas, it ensures that each of the species class are not just living right there next to one another. Next up is habitat stress. So your text mentions at least here, class, extreme conditions and pollution. So, of course, if that environment class is highly polluted, or of course, if those extreme conditions are experienced more often than not, it will definitely class have a detrimental effect, I would say, on the richness of the species. So up next is that latitudinal effect or the latitudinal gradient. So, of course, species richness class goes directly with that energy hypothesis. In areas class that are, I guess you would say, tropical or even subtropical, yes, those areas should experience class higher species richness because of that longer growing season as opposed to those areas class that have a shorter growing season or the shortest of growing season class that of course have time periods where of course there is nothing but sun and of course likely class low low temperatures so up next is of course the closeness to the margins of adjacent communities the edge effect edges class or a place in which diversity abounds and we'll get more to that class here shortly. And the next thing I'll get to, the dominance of one species over others. So if there are more ruderal or are selected species or are strategists in that area, they might, they might very well outcompete those other or native species, be it class plant species or animal species. And then here finally class geologic disturbances. And they definitely class can be a detrimental effect by having those. So as I continue, I just say, although these and other environmental factors have positive or negative effects on species richness, 
there are exceptions and variations in every explanation. So some seems to, of course, work, a, work at a large geographic scale, such as the continent, and may work at, of course, a lot smaller scale, such as in a meadow. So in many habitats, species richness is related to the structural complexity of habitats. So in terrestrial environments, the types of plants growing in an area typically determines the structural complexity. So the structural complexity class, such as a forest, offers a greater detail of potential eco ecological niches than does a simple community. And of course, I'm referring to such as an arid desert or a semi-arid grassland. So an already complex habitat, such as a coral reef, may become even more structurally complex if species potentially capable of filling vacant ecological niches evolve or migrate into the community because these species create opportunities for additional species. Thus, it appears that species richness is self-perpetuating to some degree. So species richness is going to be what I look at here, class. So in your text, you'll find figure 5418 that gives us data class that were compiled in comparable chaparral habitats, which are shrubby and woody areas, and of course, Chile, South Africa, and California. So if you look closely, class, what we have here is the structural complexity of vegetation class on that X axis, and of course, along that Y is that numerically assigned gradient of habitats, meaning based on height and density of vegetation from the low complexity, which is very dry scrub, to high complexity class with woodland, giving us the number of birds at that Y axis. So as you can see, class, that as structural complexity increases, so does the number of bird species seeing their class. So I was stating class as I almost got a little ahead of myself. We now get to how species richness is inversely related to geographic isolation of a community. So the isolated island communities are generally much less diverse than our communities in similar environments. And this is one of the continents class. This is, of course, when found on continents. So this difference is due partly to the distance effect that I just mentioned. So the difficulty encountered by many species in reaching and successfully colonizing the island. So it's sometimes that species become locally extinct as a result of random events. So in isolated habitats, such as islands or mountaintops, as I mentioned earlier, locally extinct species are not readily, not readily replaced. So those isolated areas are usually small and have fewer potential ecological niches. And it's a general to, to a generalization class that species richness is inverse related to the environmental stressors. So before I get to stressors class, there is that, of course, negative, I repeat, that inversely, that inversely proportional relationship with distance class from New Guinea in kilometers with the percentage of species inhabiting those different islands on the logarithmic scale. You all should be able to use this class and to be able to be answer questions based on give what's given here. And going on class to environmental stresses of the habitat. So only those species capable of tolerating extreme conditions can live in an environmentally stressed community. Thus, the species richness class of highly polluted streams are lower compared to that of a nearby pristine stream. In the, the same way class, the species richness of a high altitude farther from the equator community exposed to harsh climates is lower class than that of lower latitudes closer class to the equator, meaning in a community class with milder climate as we class, of course, C being shown here. So this this observation class is known as species richness energy hypothesis, which of course suggests that those differing latitudes affect species richness because of variations in solar energy. So in stating that class, although the equatorial communities class of Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru occupy only 2% of Earth's land, 
they contain, class, a remarkable 46,000 native plant species. And to help you out with that class, the continental United States and Canada, with a significantly larger land area, host a total of only class 19,000 native plant species. And of course, Ecuador alone class contains more than 1,600 native species of birds, twice as many class as the United States and Canada combined. So to get to my edges, meaning it reminds me of sedges, have edges. Species richness class is usually greater at the margins of distinct communities than in their centers. And the reason is that class and ecotone, which is a transition zone between, of course, two communities, it contains all or most of the ecological niches of adjacent communities, as well as some that are unique to that ecotone. So this change class in the composition of species here at the ecotone is known as the edge effect. So with this being the case class, Please make sure you take your time to go through these. So let's now get to class species richness being affected by geologic, geologic history. So many scientists think that the tropical rainforests are old. They are also stable communities that have undergone class relatively few widespread disturbances through history. And here in ecology class, a disturbance is just any event that disrupts the community or population destruction. So during this time, a myriad of species evolved in the tropical rainforests. And in contrast, glaciers have repeatedly altered temperate and arctic regions throughout Earth's history. And, of course, an area recently vacated by, by glaciers will have a low species richness because few species have had the chance to enter it and become established. The idea that older, more stable habitats have greater species richness class than habitats subject to frequent widespread disturbances is known as the Time hypothesis. So having gone through those class, let's get now to stability. And when I refer here class to community stability, I'm referring here class that richness may very well promote the community stability. So it's, tradi it's tradition class that ecologists assume that community stability, meaning the ability of a community to withstand disturbances, is a consequence class of community complexity, i.e. ecologists hypothesize that a community with a considerable species richness is more stable than a community with less species richness. So with this in mind, greater species richness class, the greater the species richness, the less critically important any single species should be. And of course, with many possible interactions within the community, it appears unlikely that any single disturbance could affect enough components of the system to make significant difference in its functioning. So with that class, you can look at the American chestnut tree. And of course, what supports this hypothesis is found in those destructive outbreaks of pests being more common in cultivated fields, which have low species richness, than in those natural communities class with greater species richness. So with this, it, the almost complete loss of the American chestnut tree to the chestnut blight had little ecological effect on the moderately diverse Appalachian woodlands, of which, of course, it was a formerly a part. So keep in mind, class, that, of course, although every scientist does not agree with this, it has, class, been, of course, studied. So now I'll get briefly class to community development, and I referred to this prior to such. But I would like to make sure you all know that a community does not class spring into existence full blown, i.e. it takes time class, meaning those communities, they develop gradually through that series of stages, meaning each dominated by differing species. And this is what is known as succession, meaning the process of a community developing over time involving class species in one stage being replaced by different species. So an area is initially colonized by certain early successional species, i.e. your mosses, your liverworts, your hornworts, ferns and their allies, and then of course ultimately those shrubs, those, I guess you say, 
cone-bearing plants, and then, of course, climaxing with those grasses by chance, and even class hardwood trees, i.e. the angiosperms. And, of course, these species, of course, they give way over time to others, and then, in turn, give into much later to late successional species. So succession is usually described in terms of the changes in species composition of an area's vegetation class. So I am not here class referring to animals at all. Although each successional stage also has its own characteristics and kinds of animals and other species, the time involved in succession is on the order of tens, hundreds, or thousands of years, not the millions of years involved, involved class in evolutionary time scale. So keep in mind the type of time being referred to here, class, with community development. So, of course, the two types of succession are both primary and secondary succession. So I've gone over that portion, class, in the prior lecture. So please just make sure you all have reviewed each of which. So one thing that I haven't done much with class was the island of Krakatoa. This is an Indonesian island. And it has provided scientists class with a perfect long-term study of primary succession in a tropical rainforest. So in 1883, the volcanic eruption destroyed virtually all life on the island. And ecologists have surveyed the ecosystem during the years since the devastation to document the return of life forms. And in the 1990s, ecologists found that the progress of primary succession was extremely slow, in part because of Krakatoa's isolation. So many species are limited in their ability to disperse over water. And Krakatoa's forest, for example, may have only one-tenth of the tree species richness of an undisturbed tropical rainforest near, on, of nearby islands. So the lack of plant diversity has in turn limited the number of colonizing animal species. And in a forested area of Krakatoa where zoologists would expect more than 100 butterfly species, for example, there are only two. And with secondary succession class, which I've already defined, and you should, I would say, have a great grasp of right now. I would state that during 1988, there were wire fires burned, and it was approximately one-third of Yellowstone National Park. This natural disaster provided a valuable chance for ecologists to study secondary succession in the areas that had been forests. After the conflagration class, gray ash covered the forest floor and most of the trees. Although standing were charred and dead, meaning those left standing. So the secondary succession class has occurred rapidly since 1988. And less than a year later, in the spring of 1989 class, trout, lily, and other herbs sprouted and covered much of the ground. And 10 years, or yes, and 10 years later class, in 1998, a young forest, knee high to shoulder high, lodgepole pines dominated the area. Douglas fir seedlings also began appearing in 1998, and ecologists continue to monitor the changes in Yellowstone as secondary succession continues to unfold. So now, class, I'll get to disturbance and how it influences succession and species richness. I say this because you'll be asked about the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, and of course, it's those early studies that suggested that succession was inevitably progressed to a stable and persistent community known as that climax community, which I will not say, yes, we have reached that climax community or will ever reach the climax. Of course, class, it was determined solely by climate then. So periodic disturbances such as fires or floods were not thought to exert much influence on climax communities. So if the climax community was disturbed in any way, it would return to a self-sustaining, stable equilibrium in time. This traditional view of stability has fallen out of favor. The apparent endpoint stability of species composition in the climax forest is probably the result of how long trees live relative to the human lifespan. So it is now recognized that forest communities never reach a state of permanent equilibrium, but instead exist class in a state of continual disturbance. The species composition and the relative abundance of each species vary in mature in a mature community over a range of environmental gradients, although the community retains a relatively uniform appearance overall. So because all communities are exposed to periodic disturbances, both natural and human-induced, or induced, 
ecologists have long tried to understand the effects of disturbance on species richness. So a significant advance was the development of the intermediate disturbance hypothesis by Connell. So in sure class that you know about that hypothesis because you'll be asked about it, of course, on your test. So just keep in mind that both natural and human-induced disturbances will, will cause change in species composition, and humans may have, intentionally, have to intentionally intervene to maintain species richness of the original community. So, of course, what kind and how much intervention is necessary to maintain species richness is controversial. And we'll get to this class a bit later on in chapter 57. So from here, class, I will now get where get to where I plan to be. Chapter 55. So here, class, this is ecosystems. and the biosphere. Planet Earth has often been compared to a vast sp spaceship inhabited by diverse communities of organisms. As Earth orbits the Earth, excuse me, glass, as Earth orbits the Sun, these organisms use the Sun's energy to produce oxygen, transfer energy, and recycle water and minerals, those inorganic nutrients. And it's with great efficiency that this is done. Yet, none of these ecological processes will be possible without the abiotic or non-living environment of Earth, the spaceship as it's mentioned, as Earth orbits the sun. As the sun warms the planet, it powers the hydrologic cycle, causing precipitation, driving the ocean currents the atmospheric circulation patterns, and even produces much of the climate to which organisms have adapted. The sun also supplies the energy that almost all organisms use to carry on life processes. Individual communities and their abiotic environments are ecosystems, which are those basic units of ecology. An ecosystem encompasses all of the interactions among organisms living together in an environment. So, of course... It's those organisms in that particular place, among other organisms and their abiotic environment, that of course are here in that ecosystem. So ecosystem ecology is a subfield of ecology that studies energy flow and the cycling of chemicals among the interacting biotic and abiotic parts of an ecosystem. So please keep in mind that here in this chapter class, being the 55th chapter, we're bringing in class not just biotic factors, but also those abiotic factors. So ecosystem interactions are complex because each organism responds not only to other organic organisms, but to conditions in the atmosphere, soil, and water. In turn, organisms exert an effect on the abiotic environment, as when a beaver dam creates a pond in a formerly class forested area, such as what you see here, class, on the screen. The pond is formed as the beaver builds an island lodge that will be safe from predators. However, the beaver dam also regulates the flow of water in the stream or river. It holds back water during rainy periods and releases a controlled amount of water throughout the year, even during periods of drought. So like communities, ecosystems vary in size, lack precise boundaries, and are nested within larger ecosystems. And the Earth's largest ecosystem is a biosphere, which consists of all communities Earth's communities and their interactions and connections with the planet's abiotic environment, i.e. the soil, the water, atmosphere, and rock. Let us now begin with energy flow through ecosystems. So energy flow is known as the passage of energy in a one-way direction through an ecosystem. So energy enters an ecosystem as radiant heat or radiant energy, called sunlight, that tiny portion of less than 1% class of which reaches those producers to trap and use during photosynthesis. The energy class now in chemical form is stored in the bonds of those organic carbon-containing molecules such as glucose. 
when cellular respiration breaks down these molecules, the energy becomes available class in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, to do work, such as repairing tissues, producing body heat, allowing you and I class to move about, or even class reproducing. As the work is accomplished, energy escapes the organisms and dissipates into the environment as heat to entropy, the state of disorder, not to be used again, lost. Ultimately, this heat energy radiates into space. Thus, once an organism has used energy, the energy is unavailable for reuse. And of course, having said that class, you can see it here. So in an ecosystem class, a food chain shows the energy flow as it occurs in which energy from food passes from one organism to the next. In a sequence class, it always begins, of course, with our primary producer. Whether it's class an aquatic ecosystem or one that is terrestrial, it always starts there. Autotrophs class form the beginning of the food chain by capturing the sun's energy through photosynthesis. Producers, by incorporating chemicals class, they manufacture their own biomass, their living material, and become class potential food resources for other organisms. Plants are the most significant producers on Earth, especially class in land, or at least on land, whereas algae and cyanobacteria class are the primary producers, meaning the important ones in aquatic environments. So, of course, along with that, all organisms class in communities, I repeat, all others that are not producers in a community are known as consumers, whether they be class the primary consumer, the secondary consumer, or the tertiary consumer. They're called heterotrophs, which extract energy from those organic molecules produced by other organisms. So next up, we get to what are known as trophic levels class, in which food chains are divided into. So producers always occupy that first trophic level, and then herbivores class occupy that second trophic level. And of course, thereafter, we get to the primary consumer being that class herbivore that occupies that second trophic level. So they obtain the chemical energy that the producers, molecules, and the building materials use to construct their own tissues. And the herbivores are then, of course, consumed by a carnivore, being that secondary consumer. And of course, you find those classes being, of course, at that third trophic level. And then thereafter class, we get to the tertiary consumer. So the tertiary consumer class, yes, there are also carnivores that eat the secondary consumer. And then we get to, of course, the omnivores, which are consumers that eat a variety of organisms, both plant and animal. So being, of course, omnivorous, those consumers can occupy the third or even higher trophic levels, depending upon what they eat. Other consumers, called detritus feeders or detritivores, eat detritus, which, of course, is dead organic matter. That, of course, includes animal carcasses, leaf litter, wood, and feces. So detritivores class and microbial decomposers break down dead organisms and waste products. So decomposers, also called as saprotrophs, decomposers class, also called saprotrophs, are a subset of detritus feeders. So decomposers include the microbial heterotrophs class and fungi. So these organisms supply themselves with energy by externally breaking down organic molecules and remains, the carcasses and body wastes, and ingesting the inorganic products. They typically release simple inorganic molecules, such as carbon dioxide and mineral salts, which may be reused by producers. So most bacteria and fungi class are important, are important decomposers. And of course, they are important of all those members of the food chain. So the food chains are, are a simplistic way of showing class. However, a complex of interconnected food chains, of interconnected food chains, in which, of course, provide a more realistic model of the flow of energy and materials to an ecosystem is known as that food web. So, of course, I'm saying that because in an ecosystem class, there are alternative pathways, of course, of who eats who. So you can see that class being shown in just a moment. So I've gone through class of food chains from the photograph. 
And of course, the presentation probably goes through right as finished. Ultimately, class ending up here at the food web. So there you have it. So now getting to the ecological pyramid. So with the ecological pyramid class, these are just used to compare trophic levels by determining the number of organisms, the biomass, or even the relative energy at each level that is presented graphically. So the base of each pyramid class represents the producers, and the next level will be the primary consumers, above such will be the secondary consumers, and so on, and so on. So next up class, we have the pyramid of biomass. So with this pyramid of biomass, what we have, class, is just showing that the amount of living material at each trophic level, indicating the amount of energy that's fixed at a, at a particular time. So the biomass is reduced by an average class of 90% at each trophic level. So this, called biomass, is a quantitative estimate of the total mass, or at least amount of living material. And with this, it's typically class, those units of measure vary. So sometimes it's represented as a total volume, dry weight, or even live weight, referring to biomass class. And I won't deal class much at all with the pyramid of numbers, but this goes to the, or at least speaks to the number of organisms at each trophic level in a given ecosystem. Uh, and, I, and typical of which, of course, the inverted pyramid of numbers, they are observed class as such. But I'd like to spend a little bit more time with class with the pyramids of energy. So a pyramid of energy just exhibits, or at least displays class, the energy content of the biomass at each trophic level, and people of which it is going to be in kilocalories per square meter per year. So with that being shown class, it's the force of that biomass at each trophic level. And it's common class for ecologists to use a measure of energy content is to just burn a sample of the tissue in a kilometer and a calorimeter. And using a calorimeter class, the heat released during combustion is measured to determine the energy content of the organic material in the sample. So there you have it, you all. So next we get to gross primary productivity. And this is that rate at which energy is produced, or at least the energy is captured during photosynthesis. And then as we get to that net primary productivity, this is the amount of biomass that is found in excess that has been broken down by a plant's cellular respiration for normal activities. So it's here, class, that that net primary productivity is, of course, what is available for consumers that energy there. So with that, it's only a portion of such that herbivores can use. Because of course, 25% is not digested and lost in feces. About 55% of that net primary productivity class is lost during respiration, and of course, by doing work. And then of course, it's less than 20% class that is used for new biomass. So someone might say, well, why do we eat? That class as you see it is why we eat, because it's not much of what you actually take in that can actually class be used. And so if that, of course, this is that is mentioned class is for herbivores. So of course, it's even less so class, even less so for us being, of course, homo sapiens, humans. So ecosystems, they vary class and of course the primary productivity. And as I say it that way, one way class to show it, of course, is to just look at the figure which is to come. As you see here, class, it's these areas near the equator class that are producing, I would say, much of that net primary productivity. Not so much class, those areas nearer to the poles. I almost forgot the area that's there. So it's, of course, those wetlands class, those aquatic environments, and even class those tropical rainforests that have the highest productivity. So now this class just shows you that net primary productivity for a few ecosystems, or at least a number of ecosystems. So as we start there, it's decreasing as such. So we have the algal beds and reefs, and right after those class, not far behind, are the tropical rainforests, swamps, and marshes. 
And further more class, you can see the extreme desert, the semi-desert scrub, and even open ocean area. Compare class what we just saw here. And notice, since we are here, notice where that temperate deciduous forest is. It's right there. So not far behind class, the rest of which. All right, so along with species richness class, I'll just make sure I mention that richness of species declines, of course. I repeat, in ecosystems, species richness declines with increasing productivity. In other words, class, the model suggests that a less productive environment has a patchy distribution of resources that reduces the competition and allows for a variety of organisms to, of course, coexist. And what I'll speak to now, class, as humans, as, of course, consumers. So we consume, class, far more of the Earth's resources than any other animal species. And it's at least, class, 30% of the land-based net primary productivity in, of course, an annual year. In other words, class, what we do as humans is now, class, the cause for the loss of many species that, of course, are here with a unique role in these ecosystems. So from such class, it's the human use of global productivity that's competing with other species' needs for energy. Yes, us, ours. So our need for use of so much of the world's productivity is contributing to the loss to extinction or even genetic impoverishment class, being, of course, less and less diverse of many species. We're referring to less and less diverse class gen genetically. And, of course, at these levels of consumption and, explo and exploitation of Earth's resources, along with human population growth, it threatens the planet's ability to support the occupants here class. So please keep that in mind. So we're not getting class to toxins that persist in the environment on page 1199. So as we are here, class, you've seen how energy flows through food chains and, of course, food webs and ecosystems. Well, now, consider also how toxins from, of course, pesticides or radioactive isotopes or even heavy metals class, such as mercury and industrial class chemicals, such as polychlorinated biphenyls, they enter and pass through food chains the very same way. And it's the effects, of course, of DDT on some bird species which first drew attention class to the problem. So with that, what I'm getting at class is falcons, pelicans, bald eagles, and ospreys, which live near here, are generally secondary consumers that accumulate substances in their bodies from lower levels of the food chain. So the birds are sensitive to traces of DDT and DDT metabolites in their tissues. So a substantial body of scientific evidence class suggests that DDT accumulation causes birds to produce eggs that have extremely thin, fragile shells that usually break during incubation, causing chicks' deaths. Let's make it make sense, huh? So to make it make sense, I've, I've skipped a few things, class, and I'll get to those things a bit later. But if you look closely, DDT also acts as an endocrine disruptor, reducing the fertility due to its the effects of males being feminized by that chemical. And in 1962, a biologist class called Carson published Silent Spring, which heightened public awareness about the dangers of DDT and other pesticides. And after 1972, DDT was banned in the United States as reproductive success of many birds gradually improved. Thankfully, I would say. Thankfully. So the effect of DDT on birds is a result of three characteristics of DDT. Meaning A is its persistence, B its bioaccumulation, and C its biological magnification. Now let's get to these now. So as I refer to its persistence class, is that these toxins are quite stable and take many, many years to break down into their less toxic forms. So some toxins class are extremely stable and may take many years. So it's because they are synthetic pesticides and industrial chemicals, and it's resulting of their novel chemical structures. So as they accumulate in the environment, it's because, of course, the ways to degrade them have not yet evolved in the natural decomposers, such as bacteria. 
into bioaccumulation. So when an organism when an organism does not metabolize or break down or excrete that persistent toxin, the toxin simply gets stored and it's usually in the fatty tissues. And over time, the organism may accumulate high concentrations of that toxin. So the buildup of such glass is just that, bioaccumulation. That bioaccumulation then, of course, leads directly to biological magnification. So this is when you have organisms class at higher trophic levels. And those organisms at those higher trophic levels in the food webs, such as the tertiary consumers, tend to have greater concentrations of that bioaccumulated toxin in their bodies than do those at those lower levels. So, of course, the increase in concentration class, which occurs as a toxin passes through successive levels of the food web, is just this class, biological magnification. So another reason class that when a woman is with a child, it is, of course, told to her, recommended to her, that she not, of course, eat those fishes, because those fishes class have a higher concentration in parts per million class of mercury. And, of course, one example of which class would be looking at the Long Island salt marsh that was sprayed with a DDT for mosquito control. So I won't go over all of this in and of itself, but make sure you review this class on page 1,200 class, right-hand column, because this is showing the biological magnification of DDT expressed in parts per million in that Long Island salt marsh. And it's all here, class, in the ring build goal that you see pictured there. So now onto the biogeochemical cycles. So with these biogeochemical cycles class, what I'll get to here is I'm going to do a quick review class of each of these. So the carbon cycle. As the carbon cycle occurs class, by and large, it's of course carbon found in proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, and even the carbohydrates. So in the, in the abiotic environment class, carbon is found in the atmosphere. In water, it is found as carbonate and bicarbonate and other dissolved compounds such as rock and limestone. So the way, class, that it happens is, of course, by way of organisms, including photosynthesis, we get the production class of shells by, by marine organisms. So carbon is returned to the environment class by respiration, decomposition, or the combustion of wood or even fossil fuels, such as in the car, van, truck, or SUV you may have driven today. And, of course, carbon is then stored in class for longer periods in wood, and fossil fuels, and even marine sediments. So as you all see here, the animal and plants, which go through respiration class, by way of this, we get to see, oh, what is called two. Soil microorganisms class also go through the process of some form of respiration. Then, of course, from the decomposition class, all giving us what's known as CO2. So then what happens there is plants take in that CO2 class, and by way of carbon fixation, it is then used, of course. One thing I forgot to mention here, at least, is by way of combustion class and activity of humans, as well as natural activity, we get, of course, carbon class going up into the atmosphere, being atmospheric carbon. So from such class, carbon is eroded away by way of limestone, and of course, we get the dissolved CO2 in the water. And then over many, many years class, from those fossil fuels, we now, of course, have more and more carbon in the atmosphere, and by the burning of such, as you see there. There you have it, the carbon cycle. So I won't speak to class what has happened so much. So here we'll get to this class in the 57th chapter. But I can't stress enough, class, that there has been an increased class in the burning of coarse materials, meaning I would say more so wood and fossil fuels. So with that, we have so, so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere class. And it's at a higher rate than, of course, the natural carbon cycle can handle. This excess carbon dioxide is absorbed class by the ocean and then converted into carbonic acid. And this is what's causing class ocean acidification, among other things. We'll get to this later. So with that class, it's also changing precipitation patterns, deaths of forests, and even the extinction of some organisms, and causing agricultural problems. So this might force class this, the displacement of thousands or even millions of people from those coastal areas. Thanks a lot. The, of course, incidents of more and more, and even, I guess you say, stronger hurricanes. 
I'll not look at you. Imagine no. cycle. So, to take our time to class, the Earth's atmosphere is approximately 78% nitrogen class, approximately. And keep in mind that the reactions that break up and combine nitrogen with other elements are performed primarily by bacteria. We'll get to that now with those five steps we see. The more, I'll say one of the more important ones, class, is called nitrogen fixation, converting class. What we have here is that N called to nitrogen into, of course, this NH3. So as I go through this class, I'm referring, of course, the, to the gaseous nitrogen, the N2, to, of course, NH3, being, of course, ammonia. So that form class is what organisms can use. And you may hear someone saying, yes, I'm going to go put that ammonium nitrate class on that grass field or something of that effect. So the nitrogen-fixing bacteria use nitrogenase to break up the molecular nitrogen. They're known as rhizobia. So rhizobium form nodules in the legumes, the roots of legumes. They're called root nodules. So as nitrification occurs, it's a two-phase process carried out by soil bacteria the nitrogen bacteria. Then assimilation class occurs, meaning to incorporate the nitrogen compounds by plant or even animals into their own proteins and nucleic acids, those nitrogenous, of course, compounds. And of course, the plant roots absorb what is in H3 or even class in H4. And referring to NH4 class, that of course is ammonium. And of course, NO3 negative, which of course is nitrate. And then, of course, animals consume the plant tissues. So with this, what I'll get to next of the class is denitri denitrification. So this is what you do not want to occur, because by way of denitrification class, that what is known as nitrate will be, of course, lost to the atmosphere as gaseous nitrogen. And this will render your soil class infertile. So this class shows that nitrogen cycle. So I guess I'll begin class with the nitrifying bacteria in the root nodules. So, by way of that occurring class, it is then assimilated class by way of the plants. And of course, if there is water, it will, of course, be denitrified, meaning the rendering a class useless, contributing class to the atmospheric nitrogen. And then, of course, we have nitrogen fixation class by way of human activity using a lot of energy. And then, of course, again, class, we go back to where we began with the bacteria, the rhizobia. So we as humans class affect the nitrogen cycle greatly. Thanks a lot, fertilizers. So yes, they're produced, and it takes a lot of energy to produce it. And then what happens is that rain washes the fertilizer class into lakes, rivers, and even of course along the coast, and we get the algal blooms. So of course it overgrows and dies, reducing nitrogen content, and of course we get fish kills then. And somebody may say jubilee, I'll say fish kills, i.e. the sulfating fish because of the reduction class in nitrogen content. Nitrates also can leach through the soil and then contaminate groundwater. So please, if ever you use a nitrogen class, or always what I call fertilizer, please use it responsibly and follow the label. Of course, automobile exhausts class are a, a big source of nitrogen oxides. So with this, we get, of course, what is called smog, and it causes respiratory problems class, especially in what I call metropolitan areas, larger metropolitan areas. Then, of course, nitrous oxide class, well, of course, is here, and it functions class, retaining heat in our atmosphere, i.e., promoting climate change. And it hasn't gotten any cooler. It's getting warmer and warmer and warmer. So nitrous oxide also contributes to the depletion class of the ozone layer in the stratosphere, which, of course, is their class to protect us from those ultraviolet rays. We must have stratospheric ozone. So from here, class, it also contributes to acid rain or acid precipitation and that is linked class to declining animal populations in aquatic ecosystems because of course having the influx class of hydrogen ions does not bode well class for animals so next up is the phosphorus cycle class and i'll be here briefly water erodes of course rock containing phosphorus it releases that same phosphorus class into phosphate into the soil or water and from such class plants can incorporate into their nucleic acids class and even into the phospholipids, then decomposes to return the inorganic phosphate to the soil. So with that class, the phosphate can then go into the ocean, where it remains on the seafloor for millions 
of years. And that is all I'll mention, Blast, about the phosphorus cycle. All due to the weathering of rock. Next of which class will be the hydrologic cycle, which you, all, of course, have learned as the water cycle. So with the water cycle, of course, it's because water moves class, and I would say continually class, from the ocean to the atmosphere to the land, and, of course, back to the ocean. So as it happens, class, from the atmosphere to the land, by way of precipitation, be it hail, snow, rain, or even sleet, the water enters the atmosphere class by way of evaporation and transpiration. I think you've heard of evaporation class, but of course, by way of transpiration, that water is lost class from plants. So that movement of water class from land to the ocean by way of runoff occurs, and then it seeps downward class into the ground. That groundwater class can then be stored in groundwater aquifers, and I'll just be blowing class. That water that is fresh on land is cycled this very way. So be cognizant class of what you put into the ground. There was once a time class where people put anything class into the ground, be it oil, gasoline, or even diesel. Those things class should never get into the ground because those two will not just seep into, seep into groundwater, but will also class seep into our rivers, lakes, and streams because, of course, that groundwater eventually supplies the water to the soil, streams, rivers, and plants, and even the ocean. So humans class remove, I repeat, humans class remove more groundwater than precipitation recharges, eliminating this resource, i.e., water class is not going to be here forever, at least not fresh water. Hence, of course, there are now desalination plants to, of course, remove salt from the water. This class showed the cycle. By now, class, you all should know the cycle, and I would say you know the cycle quite well. So, to finish things up in this chapter, let us now begin. So ecosystems, they depend on the abiotic environment class to supply energy and materials. So it happens by way of solar radiation class. And for each abiotic factor, organisms have an optimal range in which they can survive and reproduce. So yes, the sun class is what provides warmth here to land. But in addition to warmth class, what happens is, is it powers our cycles, the water cycle, the carbon cycle. And by way of photosynthesis class, organisms make the organic compound that, of course, is required by most organisms on Earth to live. And of course, as those fuels represent solar energy, they're captured class by those organisms. So okay, there it is. 0.02% class of what's happening here is captured by photosynthesis. And a vast majority class of sunlight class and that energy is reflected back into space immediately, and of course, about 47% is absorbed by the atmosphere. So very quickly, class, that's 77%. Thereafter, class, you'll see much of this is going to be re-radiated to space as heat. Tem temperature, class, most definitely changes with latitude. The rays, class, strike almost vertically near the equator, concentrating the energy class into the poles. And then thereafter, class, the rays of light enter the atmosphere near the poles, pass through the greater amount of air, scattering and reflecting the light. So, of course, from March 21st to September 22nd, in the Earth's northern hemisphere, class tilts toward the sun, i.e., providing class higher concentration of sunlight and longer days. Keep that in mind. However, class, from the 22nd of September to March 21st, Northern Hemisphere class tilts away from the sun, lowering the concentration of sunlight and providing class shorter days. Here then, class, summer in the Northern Hemisphere corresponds to winter in the Southern Hemisphere and vice versa. Thanks a lot, seasons. And now you all can see it. So, as I just mentioned at class, the first of which was from, of course, March to September. And then the second of which class was from September to March. So this class is how it occurs and why we have those differing seasons. So in our atmosphere class, most of which I say is going to be Nitrogen being at 78%, oxygen class is in approximately 21%, 20, 
giving you that 99% of dry air. So other gases that are here class include neon, helium, and along with that class being argon and carbon dioxide. So it's not a great percentage class of CO2 in the air. So water vapor and trace amounts of other air pollutants such as ozone, dust, pollen, methane, yes, methane, from all those, I guess you say, heads of cattle, and CFCs known as chlorofluorocarbons class. They are also there, even though class, those have been banned for a number of years. So of course here, the atmosphere performs essential ecological functions. And you're saying functions? Performed by the atmosphere? Oh, yes. They are a class supplying organisms with oxygen, supplying those photosynthetic organisms with CO2, and of course, protecting the Earth's class from most of those ultraviolet rays and X rays, and from cosmic rays from space. Yes, cosmic rays. So, in the last class, interacting with the solar energy to create weather and climate. So, I'll be here with winds here briefly, class. So, as I state about the winds, it suggests that these are the horizontal atmospheric movements that result partly from differences in atmospheric pressure and the Earth's rotation. So winds typically blow class from areas of high atmospheric pressure to areas of low atmospheric pressure. So the Earth's west to east rotation causes the winds to turn to the right in the northern hemisphere, right in the northern hemisphere, and the winds class come to the left in the southern hemisphere, giving us that Coriolis effect. So that huge body of salt water that covers that approximate class three quarters of the Earth's surface divides, of course, us into four sections, being the Indian, the Arctic, Atlantic, and Pacific. Of course, by way of those continents. So prevailing winds, they blow over the ocean, producing those movements of the surface ocean water called currents. And then, of course, those currents class and winds tend to move in the same direction. So the Coriolis effect class is what is here and contributes to the path of the surface of ocean currents. So, of course, the Earth's rotation produces that clockwise gyres class in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise gyres class in the southern hemisphere. And it's all by way of those prevailing winds, creating those circular ocean currents. And you can see those class here. That was the absolute wrong color, excuse me, you all. All right, so next up class is the wind from the atmosphere affecting the ocean currents. And what I'm referring to here class is from that heat from the ocean affects the atmospheric circulation, which provided the class or provides for the El Nino, the El Nino, excuse me, southern oscillation. So normally it's that westward trade wind that restricts warm waters to the western Pacific near Australia. As those trade winds weaken, the surface temperatures rise in the eastern Pacific, and of course, the currents may slow. They may also stop or even reverse. reverse. So that El Nino, as I just mentioned class, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, what happens then is the cold, nutrient-laden waters are prevented from upwelling, resulting class in a severe decline in the marine food web. All due to that cool, cool, cool. water there that cannot up well. So next up, I'll hit climate briefly, class. So climate is the average weather conditions, less extremes, of course, by records, that occur in a given place over a period of years. The two most important factors that determine areas of climate are both the average temperature and temperature extremes, including class precipitation. So it's temperature and precipitation, which, which of course be that both the average precipitation and the seasonal distribution of precipitation. Other factors that include in climate class are wind, fog, cloud cover, lightning caused wildfires, and humidity, which I would think we know a lot about around here. So unlike weather, which changes rapidly, climate generally changes slowly over hundreds or even thousands of years. So now you have the difference class between the both climate and weather. All 
Alright. So with this, there are day-to-day -day variations, and of course day-to-night -day variations, and even seasonal variations that are also important dimensions of climate that affect organisms, and even latitude, elevation, geography, topography, excuse me, and vegetation with distance from ocean or other large bodies of water, and of course location on a continent or the land masses influence the temperature, precipitation, and other aspects of climate. So Earth has many different climates, and it's because they have been relatively constant for many years, and organisms have adapted to them. So with precipitation patterns class, I'll be here briefly. That heavy rainfall areas of the tropic results from the evaporation of large quantities of water from the tropical parts of the ocean. So prevailing winds blow that moist warm air over those land masses. And those hot land masses cause moist air to rise. And as that rises, it cools and the moisture holding ability decreases. Clouds form and rain is released as precipitation. So dry air returns to the surface near the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, producing subtropical deserts. So what happens is mountains force air to rise, which remove moisture, and precipitation occurs on the windward slopes of the mountains, and the other side of the mountain class provides that rain shadow. Hence, we have this range of effect. So this is that windward side class with, of course, that moist air, giving us that lush growth here. And of course, on this leeward, side we have this rain shadow desert so that class is a definition of that rain shadow effect and we can see this class from of course the western coast of the united states going across the rocky mountains class even though of course that eastern face of the rockies and to end things class or nearly end things with microclimates class this is just the differences in elevation and steepness and even the directions of slopes and the exposure to sunlight and prevailing winds may produce local variations in climates. And you all can definitely see this as you all go up mountains, if ever you've been up a mountain. Fire. I'll ask you about fire class on your test. So keep in mind that fire is a common disturbance in some ecosystems. And wildfires, which are fires started by lightning, are an important ecological force in many geographic areas. Those areas provide, of course, well, that prone being, being prone to wildfire, have a wet season followed by a dry season. And they provide the vegetation that grows and accumulates during the wet season as it dries out enough for the dry season to burn more easily. So when lightning, lightning hits the vegetation on the ground, it ignites the fire to, of course, ignite that dry organic material. And, of course, the fire then spreads through the area. So fires have several effects on organisms, which you should know these class for your test. The combustion class frees minerals that were locked in the dry organic matter. The ashes remaining thereafter are rich in potassium, phosphorus, and calcium, and other minerals essential for plant growth. With the arrival of precipitation, the vegetation flourishes following the fire. Secondly, fire removes plant cover and exposes the soil. This simulates the germination and establishment of seeds requiring bare soil, as well as encourages the growth of shade intolerant plants. And bluntly class, some seeds will not germinate unless first they are burned. Third, fire causes increased soil erosion because it removes plant cover, leaving soil more vulnerable to wind and water. So of course, class, I'll be blunt, humans try to prevent fires. They call it fire suppression. And sometimes this effort has disastrous consequences, meaning when fire is excluded from a fire adapted ecosystem, Dead wood and other plant litter accumulate. Can you think of California right now? So as it happens, class, result in a witch, when a fire does occur, it can be very destructive. They, are, they also call them wild. So, so there's sometimes deadly wildfires in Colorado or even California are blamed in part to decades of fire suppression in the region. Prevention of fire also converts grassland to woody vegetation and facilitates the invasion of fire-sensitive trees into fire-adapted forests. Controlled burning class, which occurs here, and of course especially in Florida, is a tool of ecological management, which I'll ask you about, which I will ask you about. And as it occurs class, it's in which the undergrowth and plant litter are deliberately burned under controlled conditions before they have accumulated to dangerous levels. Controlled burns are also used to suppress fire 
sensitive trees, thereby maintaining the natural fire adapted ecosystem. And class, this is what occurs. This is what, sh well, this is what should occur, I'll say. And, and if it doesn't happen, class, well, I'll say it this way. Plant diversity class could most definitely decline. So this is why I would say control burning class is integral to, of course, those healthy communities, those healthy ecosystems. So to end things, class, I'll go to long term well, long-term ecological research studies. One such example class is at the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. It's huge. And there is so much research class being done at Hubbard Brook. And it began in the late 1950s class, and of course, continues to, to today. So many experiments have been done there, and one such class dealt with deforestation. And I'll say, take some time to review this class on your own. I won't go through this here and now in lecture, but it's amazingly class important to review just how deforestation class affects ecosystems. Because of course, they can now see just how much, of course, soil erosion has occurred, and not just soil erosion class, but of course, also the loss of those essential minerals due to, of course, the increased runoff class of water. Because it's, I mean, you can use those catchments glass to see just how much the quantity, the timing, and the quality of water are flowing from that forest of watershed as opposed to, of course, that watershed that has been deforested. Because it's these large, of course, long-term ecological research studies that can allow class one to study energy flow, the cycle of nutrients, and the effects of natural and human-induced disturbances such as air pollution, tree harvesting class, and land use changes. So I hope that this interests you, class, for those who are interested in biology, and of course, ecology more broadly. But this is just enabling ecologists to evaluate and predict the effects of the environmental change and human-induced change. So from this, I hope ecological management class, which of course would be that conservation approach that emphasizing restoring and maintaining the quality of an entire ecosystem rather than the conservation of individual species, makes, of course, use of such knowledge. This has been your instructor, Skylar Huff. Thank you all for listening, and please prepare well for your test.